and welcome to Chapter 1, Database Systems. We're going to go over some basic concepts of databases, different types of databases, and why you need a database management system. Let's get started. The first thing we're going to cover is the difference between data and information. So there is a big difference between them. Data is just raw facts, must be formatted, they don't mean anything in and of themselves. 5,000, 123, 240 Main Street. They don't mean anything. They're just facts. They're just data is just raw facts that doesn't mean anything until it is processed. Information is data that's been processed. It's been processed to pre create meaning. It requires context and it can become knowledge. So when you take that 5,000 and you say 5,000 is how much it costs for the new laptop I want, now it has meaning. Now it has context. It's now information. From that point, you can start making decisions and you can make good decision making if you have good data and the data is processed in such a way that it became information. Data management is what we're doing with the database. We are generating, storing, and retrieving data to create knowledge, to create information. An important thing to keep in mind when you're dis making decisions regarding data. Is the data accurate? Is the data relevant? And is the data timely? These are three really important parts about data that you need to keep track of. If the data is not accurate, it doesn't do you any good. Well, if I thought the computer cost $5,000 and it really cost eight, that 5,000 was really irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. It's not accurate. Relevancy would refer to, and this computer um, was made on the 13th of, of February. Is that really relevant? Do I really care? So when you think about relevancy, you want to think of, is this something that I care about? Is it something that is useful to me? And then, of course, timely. I need to be able to get the information in and then out of the database in a timely fashion or else it's useless. All of that goes into being able to make good decisions with your data. Okay? So a big question is, what is a database? Well, a database is simply a collection of data. It's a, it's a base of data. It's a place where data goes to be stored. We think of a database as a shared, integrated computer structure that stores your data. So when we think of a database, we generally think of data that's being stored somewhere that can be used by multiple users. And it's important to know that that's where the data is being stored and that it can be accessed. There's also a concept of metadata, which is data about data, information about your data. So you can have your data that says 5,000 and it can be in a field called price. By having it in a field called price, I now know more about that data. I have information about my data and that gives me my metadata. It's in a table called prices of, you know, inventory of items and that gives me more information about my data. So your metadata is your information about your data, your data about your data. To use our data in our database, we're going to need something called a database management system or a DBMS, database DB. MS management system. And your DBMS is your interface between your user and the data itself. So a data, DBMS is a way to get all of the information from your database to your user. The DBMS is kind of like a firewall. It holds information in and it controls what is being shared. So whether or not I want to control my security, which users are able to access which data, whether I want to make sure that my data can be shared, that this data can be used by these users, multiple users all at the same time, whether I want to do data access, I want to query, I want to question the database and ask information, the DBMS handles all of this. An important part about the DBMS is that it helps you to get good data, quality data, which helps you have better decision making and increased productivity because the more information you know, the better, the more productive you can be. So this is your DBMS and it's going to help you set up all of the different pieces of information so that it can control that interface between you and your data. Different types of databases. So 
there's lots of databases out there. It's not just one. So each different database kind of has its own little nuances and the things that make it different from the others. If they were all the same, it wouldn't make any difference. Why would you pick one over the other? But in this case, there are multiple different database types. So let's start with the basic. You can have a single user versus a multi-user database. So a single user would be like a Microsoft Access database that sits on your computer, runs on your computer, and you use it on your computer. You don't need to have an internet connection because it's sitting on your computer. You can access it directly. And it is single user. You are the only one who can touch it. You can't share the Access database. They've actually added some add-ins so that you could if it was in a stored location like on your OneDrive. But in general, an Access database is a single user database as opposed to a multi-user database where you want to be able to have multiple users come in and use the data at the same time. You need to keep track of that so that they're not clobbering each other, they're not overwriting each other's information. So we want to have the difference between a single user and a multi-user. There is a centralized versus distributed. A distributed database can be stored in multiple locations. So we can have a server that sits in Seattle and another one in Wisconsin and another one in New York. And each of these different databases can hold all of your data in multiple locations. This helps for making sure that if there's any type of power outage or any type of natural disaster, your data doesn't get clobbered. Centralized means it's all in one location. So you can have it sitting in your office, you can have it on an off-site location that is still in your town that you can access from there. So centralized versus dis distributed. You can have a cloud database, which is the database we're going to be using in this course. We're going to be using a Microsoft Azure database. It's going to be a SQL Server database sitting on, on the cloud. So a cloud database is stored in a cloud location, whether it be Microsoft or whether it be Amazon or whether it be one of the other cloud locations, your database is stored in the cloud, which controls a whole lot of data security and making sure that it's safe from phishing or from and denial of service attacks. It also makes sure that any user from any location can access it as long as they have permission. So lots of benefits of having cloud databases. Unfortunately, the database is not sitting on your, in your office, so you can't walk over to it and control management that way, but a lot of people don't do that anyway, so um, cloud databases are great. You can have your database designed as a general purpose or a discipline specific. Is it only going to hold certain pieces of information or is it going to be general purpose for everybody? If you had a database for your office, do you want to have a separate database for accounts payable and accounts receivable? and um, sales versus HR? Or do you want to have one general purpose database that everybody can access? So again, keeping track of what is the purpose of your database, why are you doing it, and what can you get out of it? We can have an operational versus an analytical. An operational database is designed for data to go in and out and flow all the time. So I want to retrieve information, I want to get information, I want to be continually manipulating it as opposed to an analytical database that is designed for data to go in and then allow us to do analysis on that data. There isn't a whole lot of in and out and munging and, and changing around and updating and deleting data. It's a lot of data goes in and then the data gets handled. It gets managed. It gets analyzed. So that would be an analytical database. We can have a structured versus an unstructured or even a semi-structured database depending on how you want your data to be structured as far as the relational as the um, database management system is designed. So we can have an unstructured database. This is more like the big data NoSQL type databases as opposed to structured, the relational database that we're going to be using. You can have um, a XML that is going to help you to understand or to keep track of your data. You can store your data as XML which is a markup language, which allows you to make some differences in how your data is stored. And then, of course, we're going to get into some big data, NoSQL type database designs in this chapter to explain how those are done. This course is not going to be a NoSQL course. We are not going to be talking about NoSQL a lot, but I do think that it's an important thing for you to understand. So again, we're going to talk about that a little later in this chapter. Let's keep going. Database design is probably the most important part of databases, of data as a whole. You can do, you can have a beautiful DBMS and a poorly designed database and your data is going to be crap. It is very important that you design your database to meet all of your user requirements. And it doesn't just happen. So when you are writing an essay or when you are even developing a program, 
some programmers can start from the beginning and just start typing and it just flows out of them and they get this beautiful program and it works wonderfully because they can kind of visualize it all in their head with the database it isn't really like that with the database you have to design it you have to know what your end user requirements are before you start and you have to be able to design it to meet those end user requirements if you don't your database will not be designed well I have had more than one project that we have had to rewrite the entire database because we did not understand the user requirements when we designed it the first time so database design is very important database design encompasses all of the activities that focus on the design of the database structure that's going to be used to store and manage your end user data what does that mean? It just means when you're building your database, you need to think about how are your tables designed? How are your fields in your tables? How are they related to each other? And how can I get the data I want out of the design that I'm creating? If you only want certain pieces of information, certain designs work better than others. Otherwise, you may want to have it very normalized, not very normalized. There's a lot of decision making you need to make. And they need to understand your user requirements before you even get started. That's where we start getting into our designs, our, our entity relationship designs, and our UMLs. So we'll talk about those. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the history of the file data processing. So back in the olden days, before computers really became computers, we used to have my, manual file systems. Pencil and paper, file folders and cabinets, and it worked okay. For most people, that worked just fine. You could keep track of your clients or your customers, you keep track of your vendors, you could handle your accounts payable, and you could keep everything in your file cabinets and it kept everything fine. Small companies really wasn't a problem, um, and it worked most of the time. Then people, companies got larger and you couldn't get as much done in a paper filing system, manual filing system. It just didn't work as well. We needed to move to computers. Problem with moving to computers is it required someone to be able to process the data and understand how to design the systems. And a lot of systems were designed badly. And if the system is designed badly, the person who used to have this beautiful file system that they understood and they knew where the file cabinets were and they knew how to get their data, couldn't get their data anymore. And it got really frustrating. So people would get really frustrated with these new computer systems that didn't seem to work as well as the old systems. That's where we come in. Our goal is to try to make our databases as efficient as possible, as accurate, and help the users to actually get their data. The first computer file systems had some issues. The first was obviously the development time. It doesn't start instantly. You have to build it. You have to develop it. It, it took some time, and it got frustrating for people that were waiting for that. So. I have a system, it works just fine with my pencil and paper and my file cabinets, and you're going to put me on a computer system, but the development is, is taking too long. So that was an annoyance. People who didn't design it well or who didn't have a user interface that was really intuitive had a real hard time finding the answers that they needed. We had system administration, so you had to have somebody who actually administered it, made sure that it was set up correctly, made sure all of the data was available. That was annoying. There were some security issues where if we had designed the database expecting all the users to have access to all of the information, but why do other people have access to my clients and vice versa? So there were some security issues. And of course, the data sharing, you have to be careful with that. There was data sharing. You could share data, but it depends on how the interfaces were designed and how you were able to get the information out. So, so there was data sharing, but it had some troubles. And of course, it took time to program, the extensive programming, the time it took to create admin screens, user interfaces, and GUIs so that people could actually read their data. These were all problems that they had when they converted from basic file systems over to computer file systems. Along with those issues, we also had some other issues. There's the concept of data instructor and structure dependency and independency. 
if you think of it as my data should be able to exist without the other data. So let's look at this as a school. A school has classrooms. If the school building burns down, the classrooms no longer exist. They are completely dependent upon the school existing. There is no purpose to having the classrooms as an object in your data if there is no school to put them in. However, if you have a student, the student exists independently of the school. If the school no longer exists, if the class no longer exists, the student better still exists. They're still a person. And you may be able to move your classrooms somewhere else and be able to add the student at that point. So the student is independent of whether the classroom exists, as we found with our coronavirus. So um, you have your structure and you have your data. And the big question with independence and dependence is if I change the data, will it break the system? Will the system break because I change data? If the system doesn't break because you change the data, then there's some independence going on. There's some things that exist without that data. Whereas if the system does break because I changed data, then we're all dependent on each other and that data is dependent upon whatever was changed. Dependence and independence. There's also the concept of data redundancy and we're going to talk about a lot of data redundancy as we start building our queries and building our tables. Data redundancy can be the concept of having the same data in multiple locations at the same time. If I have two different tables and they both hold the address for my client, if my client changes their address, what happens when I change one table but don't change the other? Now I have an inconsistency or a data inconsistency because I had redundancies in my data that caused data to be in the same place at the same time. So changing one did not change the other and vice versa. So really important when you're designing your data to try to limit your data redundancy as much as possible so that you don't end up with data inconsistencies. There's also the problem when people key enter in data, so they actually data entry, that they transpose numbers, that there's some data entry errors. We can design our system to handle as few of those as possible. We can have drop downs and we can have validation checks to make sure that that data is still consistent, but you're going to get some data entry errors. And the, you need to find a way when you design your data to be able to handle those data entry errors as well as possible. We're calling it mitigation. We are trying to handle it nicely without breaking everything. There are some data integrity issues if there's if something on the disk gets damaged or if there's problems with data entry or queries or triggers or, or procedures that make it so that the data is not consistent, we have some data integrity issues. Is the data, it, does it have integrity? Is it intact? And then of course just basic data anom anomalies, sunstroke, sunspots, so on and so forth. When we think about our data, there are two different ways to see it. There is the logical data format, which is how you visualize your data and the actual physical data format, which is how it exists on the disk drive on the server. When I look at a database, I can see tables and I can see relationships and I can see fields and I can see data types and they all kind of exist in this amorphous abstract blob in front of my eyes because that's how I see databases. So how you visualize your database, if you're stopping and you're thinking about it and close your eyes and you envision your database, there's your visual of your database, your logical data format versus your physical. Your logical data format is going to be expressed in what we call an ERD. We'll get into those in a second. So in your, in your development design and in your UML. Whereas the physical is how your DBMS is actually creating it. Like how is it actually built on the server? Your database system exists in a large environment that includes lots of different things. Inside your environment, we have our hardware, our physical devices. Where is the server? Where is the actual disk drive? We have our software, which is our DBMS or maybe the operating system or any utilities that exist. This is the hardware and the software. We have our workflow or our procedures of how does data get into our database and how does it come out of our database? What are our procedures to get information in and out? And then of course the data itself. Where is the data? How is it hanging out? What's it doing? And where is the data itself that exists in our database system? The other part of it is all the people involved. 
there are a lot of people involved in a database and it could be that that same person covers all of these these roles and it could be that you have multiple people handling each role so we have a system admin the guy who controls the actual system of the device the, the computer itself as opposed to the database admin who is the guy that makes sure that the database is set up correctly so our system admin would deal with utilities and operating systems and making sure that there's no downtime on the actual device. Whereas your database admin is the guy that makes sure that your tables are created correctly and your users are correctly um, designed with the correct permissions. You have your database designer, the guy who designs the database itself. He creates the tables and the queries um, on a sketch, kind of like an architect as opposed to the programmer, who is the guy who actually writes the query and runs the query to actually make it happen. And then of course, the most important part of your entire database system environment is your end user, the guy who wanted the information at the end. He's the one you need to think of at the back of your head every time you design a database. The end user is the guy that's important. What is he trying to do? How, is he, how, is, how are you going to make his life easier? That's your job. Our DBMS has lots of functions that it entails and it handles. The great thing with the DBMS is that it does all of this stuff for you. You don't need to worry about a lot of it as long as you design your database correctly and you ask the DBMS to handle it. He handles your data dictionary and your storage. He handles the movement of data back and forth between your database and your output, whether you have an API or whether you're attaching to it directly through Management Studio or whether you're using it in an app, he is going to handle all of that information. His security, he is taking care of which users are allowed to use which data. Your access between multiple users, he'll handle backup and recovery as long as you set up a backup and recovery for your database, he handles all of that. He also allows you to do SQL queries, which is your database access language. You are running um, a structured querying language against your database to get data out. He runs all of that inter interfaces between the application and the database. All the communication is all handled through your DBMS. Your DBMS is different depending on which database you use. So if you are going to use a SQL Server database, you're using SQL Server DBMS. Oracle, you're using the Oracle DBMS. Each of them is built a little differently, kind of like Microsoft Word versus Google Docs. They're both text editors, but they do things a little differently. The different databases work the same way. They all hold data and they run all of these DBMS functionalities, but they sometimes handle it a little differently. When you have a DBMS, you're gonna run into some issues. The first and most important is the increased cost. If you have a cost issue and cost is a big problem, you might wanna scale down to either a Microsoft Access or a MySQL database, which can be run for free. A lot of companies make this mistake. Yes, it's a mistake. They want the free thing, so they go use MySQL, and then they start building their database, and they realize three years down the road that their, date, their MySQL database is not good enough for everything they want to do. It doesn't have enough processing power. It can't handle everything that they've done. And then they have to, to upgrade it to SQL Server or Oracle or one of the other databases because MySQL is just not big enough. It's just not good enough. So there's that increased cost with the larger databases. Again, if you are making a small database for a small company, MySQL usually works fine. When you start getting into 50 or 100 employees and people hitting the database all the time, the bigger ones are more important. And it's worth the cost to decrease the downtime and the other complications that you're going to run into. Your complexity obviously is the larger your database, the more complex it's going to get. The management of that complexity is hard. And that's a problem with DBMS is the more data you have, the more information your complexity increases. Staying current. Maintaining currency is not about money, it's about staying current. So as you can imagine, you have to upgrade your database, you have to stay updated with all of the new updates or replacement cycles. So those are things to keep track of when you're thinking of creating a DBMS or building your DBMS for your database, what is going to be the cost of keeping myself current? How often do they do run updates and how is that going to affect my downtime? There's also the vendor dependence. Are you working with Microsoft? Are you working with Sun Microsystems? Are you working with Oracle? Are you working with somebody else? 
that is a specific vendor that you are now dependent upon. If you are using a SQL Server database and you want to switch it over to an Oracle database, that's not really easy, especially if you have a large amount of back-end data and functionality in the back that keeps track of things. It's not just a straight, let's move it from one to the other. If you've ever tried to download a Google Docs document into Microsoft Word or vice versa, sometimes there's some complications, same issues. So, so think about those issues when you're working with your DBMS. The more DBMSs you work with, the more you'll understand which ones work better in which situations. If you get to the point that you love databases like I love databases, you might want to have your job with databases. And there is a lot of different things you can do. You don't have to just be a database developer. Think of a de database developer as the programmer who actually builds the database. You can be a database designer, which is kind of like the architect that designs the database and hands it off to a developer. You can be a DBA, which is a database administrator. He's the guy who maintains it, makes sure that the database stays up to date, keeps track of queries, writes procedures, so on and so forth. You can have your analyst, the one who helps to develop analytical databases to make sure that your decision making is good and makes your reporting. Your architect is the designing and implementation of the database environments. He does that conceptual, logical, physical, keeps those straight, your different environments. You can be a consultant, which is a database that, a guy that goes in and he helps companies to build better databases. He helps them to understand the different technologies and how they can make it better in their specific instance. Security officer, the guy who handles making sure users get the right security in and out. Cloud computing, that is a big thing right now. If you can walk into a company and say, I have experience with cloud computing databases, that gives you this big leg up of saying, I understand how the cloud works and how to use the databases in the cloud. And then, of course, there's the data scientist who analyzes all the information. They're, they're more like a mathematician in, the, in their analysis with statistics, but they are able to use the data in the database to get their data out and analyze it lots of different directions you can go in depending on what your skill set is and what interests you the best. All right, so that is the end of chapter one. Chapter one is a, is, is a pretty long chapter with a lot of text. It's going to take you a while to get through it all because some of the words may be new and it may take you a little while. Please read the chapter because I've really just touched on concepts that I'd like you to read a little bit more into. Big things to remember, data is raw facts, whereas information is your process data. Data is in a database managed by a DBMS. Database design is probably the most important part of your database, designing it correctly with the end user in mind, being able to understand how the data is going to get in and out. And there are limitations, including how to program it, your system admin, and of course, money. Money is always a big issue. For your homework for chapter one, there's a couple of questions. If you go into D2L, you'll see the list of questions. I didn't do everything because I, I think that that's just a waste of your time. And I really want you to get started on chapter two. But there are some questions. I think it's like eight or nine. Um, just making sure you understand some basics about the terminology that we've covered in chapter one and understand about database design. You're going to just open up a Microsoft Word document or some sort of document and you're just going to write those in and then just submit a file. Uh, for this purposes, you're not working with the database yet. We'll have our team meeting this week, so hopefully that will give you some more information on how this class is going to go, and um, hopefully we'll have a fabulous week.